Hi there, I'm Peter Millard, and in today's workshop I'm going to show you how I bend skirting board or baseboard to fit around a curved wall. That's coming up next. So I put a picture up on my Instagram uh, a week or two back uh, about an old job that I did that had a, a curved wall and at the foot of this it had a curved baseboard, a curved, curved skirting board. Uh, I didn't really think too much of it, uh, but it is far and away the most liked still picture I've ever had on Instagram. Uh, if you don't follow me on Instagram, give it a try. I used to be a photographer. I take a decent snap. Um, so I th anyway, uh, the, uh, I thought I'd just do a quick uh, recap of how that skirting board came about uh, and how you do it. It's a very simple technique called kerf cutting. And it's a question of scoring the inside uh, of, of the skirting board with very consistent uh, in both spacing and depth kerf cuts. So literally the thickness of the blade, uh, slightly more than the thickness of the blade apart, and providing you keep that consistent and even, that will actually bend very nicely through 90 degrees. Now, if you're doing this uh, around uh, if it's a, a run of skirting that then goes around a corner and continues on, obviously you'll need to mark up where you want those kerf cuts to come rather than trying to join those pieces in. Uh, and that's easy to do, you just sort of offer the skirting up, put a mark on where the 90 degree, uh, where, the, where the curve begins and then follow that curve around with the skirting board uh, and put another mark and then that's where you know that your kerf cuts uh, need to be. Now, it doesn't matter how you do your kerf cuts. Uh, I've done it with a plunge saw or a mitre saw. Uh, but if you use a mitre saw, it must have a trenching cut. So when you're doing these trenching cuts, when you've got to make sure that you go all the way through the material from side to side at a consistent depth. And remember, you're only going to leave about one, one and a half mil of actual tree meat left in that workpiece. So you've got to be very careful about how consistent you are, how much pressure you apply to the saw as you make that cross cut because that can affect the depth of cut. And the other thing you're going to do, uh, you'll need to do if you are using a mitre saw is fairly obviously, as we talked about this in the track saw workshop, if you saw that, uh, the depth of the maximum depth of cut of the saw blade is only ever at the center. So you've got to make sure that that blade goes all the way through. And if you've raised the depth of cut slightly to leave that trench, you're not going to get all the way through the material. It won't be consistent all the way across. So what you do to get around that is typically to put a false fence in uh, on the workpiece, a sacrificial fence ideally, because then that also gives you a cut line to gauge where your next cut needs to go. And the other thing you've got to keep an eye on is the material itself. Obviously when you've only got one or one and a half mil of material thickness left on the workpiece, uh, it needs to be absolutely flat while you're making these cuts. I started this one earlier on when I, when I was doing the test pieces before I realised that it had a slight cup, a slight twist to it, and that was enough just to throw off the depth of cut completely at one end. I don't know if you can see that well. If I pop a light behind it, maybe you can see it's not too bad at, at the base, but much, much thinner up towards the top. Uh, and that inconsistency was enough just to make it snap. Uh, now that's not such a bad thing if you've only done half a dozen cuts. If you've done 20 or 30 cuts and then that happens, that would really <laughs> kind of ruin your day. And these cuts need to be consistent, slightly more than the thickness of the saw kerf I found to be particularly good. You can take it thinner, but then you run the risk of getting it too thin. And if that happens, if you start getting bits that are missing, then it's very easy uh, to get those flat, sort of slightly planar sides to it. Plus, of course, if you do go too thin with it, it's very easy to snap one of the ends off, which is what happened to me here. That to be more observant amongst you. You might have noticed that there are, <laughs> I've actually done this three times, there are slight uh, uh, cast changes amongst the work pieces uh, between the various little bits and pieces of me doing the fast forwarding. But really, that's that's all there is to it. It's a, a, a simple, careful technique uh, that works really well. There's no steaming, there's no fancy footwork involved. It's just a question of making small, accurate cuts with a very fine tolerance uh, that just allows the natural timber to curve around like that. Now, obviously, it's relatively easy 
to use this technique on a square edge board like this, much more challenging if you've got some kind of moulding involved along the top, although the moulding will of course hide a lot of these kerf cuts. Uh, I'm fortunate that the, the ones I've done have all been uh, square edge timber and they've actually had a painted finish which has been, uh, uh, which has made life a lot easier for the finishing because I can just fill those and paint over them. If it had been a natural timber finish and they both went in as a uh, natural timber then I'd have had to have uh, filled that with the old sawdust and wood glue trick I think and then try and get a, as clean a finish on the top of that as possible. So when would you want to use a technique like this? Well, pretty much any time when you want to shape a piece of wood around a curve, basically uh, a bay window springs to mind, or maybe at the foot of a stairs, uh, or around a curved wall perhaps. Uh, the one that I used this for originally, where I showed you the picture of earlier, was actually in one of the last big bathroom builds that I did, and that had a curved wall uh, by design and I'll be going through that job in a future video, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. A series of videos actually where I take you through some older jobs that were interesting that I managed to do pre-YouTube. I won't have videos of those, but I usually have lots of photos of the builds. I know, who can imagine a life pre-YouTube? Uh, before you go, can I just remind you that the best way not to miss one of my videos is to subscribe to the channel. And if you do subscribe, don't forget to hit that bell. Then you'll be notified whenever I put up something new or when YouTube gets around to it because it's a little bit flaky, to be perfectly honest. Uh, do take a minute as well to check out the description box below the video as there's all kinds of handy dandy little bits and pieces and links to all manner of useful stuff, including the stuff I use in this video, as well as links to support the channel through Patreon or PayPal. And I want to take a minute just to thank everybody who provides their support, either through the Patreon process or through one-off or recurring donations. You are quite literally helping me keep the lights on here. As I mentioned at the top of the video, I post to Instagram most days, so try giving me a follow there. The Maker community is pretty big on Instagram, so even if you don't find the stuff I post of any particular interest, that's behind the scenes photos, short form videos, and trailers for the YouTube stuff, then you'll probably find something else worth looking at. But that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching the 10 minute workshop, which is never 10 minutes, and I'll see you next time. Take care.